I've now owned my Polestar Polestar 2 for two whole years. Minus a month, and I've driven it 77,000 miles. It's almost like I like to drive it. Last year, for the one-year Polestar update, I told you about the depreciation situation and how dire it was. Well, I'm happy to report this year, things have improved. And, unrelated, I've discovered this new coping mechanism called Denial. You should try it sometime. I paid $62,500 for it new, and now it's worth, let's go to kbb.com, select Polestar, two, 77,000 miles, go through options, it has the performance pack and the plus pack, but it doesn't have the pilot pack, hit go, and the trade-in value is, oh, $18,000. That's, that's fine. It's fine. It's totally fine. It's only $50 depreciation per day. It could be worse. Could be a lot worse. Uh, it's, it's fine. It's, um, I only owe double what it's worth. Could be triple. It's fine. It's, um, it's good. It's a good, it's a good thing, actually. It's a good thing. I'm happy it's worthless. <laughs> Because this video is comprised mostly of complaints, I wanted to let you know right off the bat that I love this car. It's fast. It's comfortable. It handles extremely well. And the software is okay. Uh, no. There we go. This thing hustles. I love to bomb around in it everywhere. Back roads and city streets. It's just fun to drive everywhere, which is part of the reason why I've racked up so many miles. So 100% would buy again. Thanks for watching. No, that's later in the video. I'll start off with the thing a lot of people are worried about when it comes to high mileage EVs, and that's battery health. First of all, you cannot tell anything about battery state of health from range or estimated range. It's too inaccurate. There's too many variables involved. Don't even be tempted to guesstimate battery health based on range or estimated range. So how do you tell battery health then? Well, one way is to ask the car. Most, if not all, modern EVs track battery health internally. These metrics can be a bit off, but they're a far more accurate approximation than any range test would be. I got a third-party diagnostic software for Volvos and Polestars called Orbit that reported to me, among other things, the battery state of health percentage as reported by the car. But before I tell you what that number was, just a quick word on how battery degradation works. Another qualifier? Just get to the number! No! Information is important. Battery degradation is not linear. You get a big hit of degradation right at the beginning, whether that's the first year of ownership or first several thousand miles, I don't know, and then it tapers off from there. Here's a graph I made up. So if you have 10% degradation at 50,000 miles, which would be kind of high by the way, that doesn't mean you'll have 20% degradation at 100,000 miles. It'll probably be more like 11 or 12% degradation. And now that you know that, at 77 kilomiles, my battery state of health, as reported by the car, is at 91.5% which is about where I expect it to be. So my 71 kilowatt hour gross battery pack is now more like 71.4 kilowatt hours gross. I expect at 100,000 miles, I'll be at about 90% state of health. We'll see if I'm right. Changing direction completely, I'm on my third set of tires now. The factory set were Continentals. They were great, but they didn't last an especially long time. And by not especially long, I mean they hardly lasted at all. So when I upgraded them, I got Pirellis because they were supposed to last a lot longer, which they did but I hated everything else about them. Their wet weather performance was terrible, their dry weather performance was terrible, and they were noisy. I hated them a lot. So when I got a puncture in one of the tires, rather than just patch the tire and move on, I took that as an opportunity to upgrade to a set of tires that I didn't hate. I went back to Continentals. These are DWS 06s, and I love them. They probably won't last all that long, but I don't care. You don't want something you hate to last a really long time. That's just more time you're stuck with it which is coincidentally how I feel about the Toyota Corolla. In last year's update, I told you about the time that I got distracted and absolutely curb stomped the right front wheel and how I sent my car off to my nearest Polestar service center for a wheel alignment and to replace the warped rotor. And I also told you how I thought this wheel might be bent because of some vibrations in the front axle and because that rotor was warped again. Well, guess what? I was right. The wheel was indeed bent, as was the wheel hub and the brake rotor. So I sent it off to the Polestar Service Center to have those things replaced, which was not cheap. So now on this corner, I'm on my second wheel and my third brake rotor because I'm an idiot. Another issue I've had that you could argue is my fault, but I would say that it's not my fault, is for a period, the airbag light came on. I took this autocrossing at some point last year, and on the first corner of the first run, I dove onto the brakes, and the airbag light came on, indicating that there was something wrong with the airbags somewhere. And it stayed on for about 10,000 miles. So did I fix it? 
No, I was too lazy to take it to the service center, but it didn't matter because somewhere in Nashville, I hit a really big pothole. And when I hit that pothole, the airbag light went back off again. And it hasn't come back on since. And this was like six months ago. So thank you, Terrible Roads of Nashville. And that's all the issues I've had since last year's update. Okay, I've had two other issues since last year's update, but they're not my fault. Okay, one of them might be my fault. There's a subtle but annoying grumbling clicking sound coming from the right rear CV shaft at low speeds under regen. And there's a really annoying popping sound coming from somewhere in the right front suspension. But that's the one that might be my fault because that's the corner that I absolutely smacked into a curb. Both of these noises started happening before the car's warranty ended at 50,000 miles, so naturally I had it trucked off to the Polestar Service Center for them to have a look at it. Unfortunately, they said, we don't hear anything, and sent it back. And now it's out of warranty. So I guess I just deal with the noises now. They don't seem to be a symptom of a bigger issue, so I think it's fine. I have had this wheel off to look at the suspension. I can't tell where the noise is coming from, and nothing looks or feels off, so... I guess my car just makes two noises now. Thankfully, the obnoxious squeak coming from somewhere in the rear suspension that I mentioned in last year's update was fixed by the service center. So that's nice, that sound was really annoying. As a reminder, my nearest Polestar service center is over 400 miles away in Columbus, Ohio. Or at least it was until Polestar built a new service center in Franklin, Tennessee, but that's still 250 miles away. While it was under warranty, Polestar would pay to have my car shipped out to the service center for warranty related issues. But now that it's out of warranty, it's not going back to the service center unless I absolutely have to take it. Be good. Please don't do breaky things. Speaking of the warranty, the battery is still under warranty and will be until I hit 100,000 miles, which at my current rate will happen by the end of the year. I'll report back once I hit 100,000 miles, unless I forget. This car has been relatively trouble-free, which I want to act surprised by, but I really fully expected it to be trouble-free. I mean, heck, if I expected it to have troubles all the time, I wouldn't have bought it, because when I bought it, my nearest Polestar service center wasn't in Columbus, Ohio. It was even further away in Minneapolis, Minnesota. This video is factored by sponsors. Sponsored by Factor. Ready to heat meals delivered straight to your door. Factor meals are delivered straight to your door in a chilled box. When you're hungry, just pick your meal, in my case, chicken cacciatore, which is incredibly good. Puncture the film to vent it, pop it in the microwave for two minutes, and enjoy your meal. These are really good. Every week you have 35 meal options to choose from, including popular options like keto, calorie smart, vegan, and protein plus. Factor meals are great for when I'm on the go or don't have time to go out and get food or cook myself or really any other time. They're just great meals. In fact, it continues to make restaurant quality meals come out of a microwave and it's like, it's like magic. This chicken cacciatore is amazing. I recommend everyone try Factor and that's not just because they're paying me to make this ad. Factor is really good. So if you want to try it, go to factor75.com and use code AGINGWHEELS50 at checkout for 50% off your first box and 20% off your next box. Again, that's factor75.com and use code AGINGWHEELS50 for 50% off your first box and 20% off your next box. You won't regret it. It's really good. And because it's an EV, the only maintenance has really been tire replacements. Once it hits 100,000 miles, I'll probably check the coolant, maybe check and flush the gearbox oil if it calls for that sort of thing. EVs aren't maintenance free, but they sure are close to it. I'm really, I'm, I'm inviting problems at this point, aren't I? Please, please, please don't do breaky things. My two biggest gripes with this car have been and continue to be efficiency and I wouldn't be upset if it charged faster. 150 kilowatts peak and a 10 to 80% time of about 35 minutes isn't the worst thing in the world, but it's really not fast enough for how often I road trip this thing. And 3.2 miles per kilowatt hour on a good day, I'm talking like peak efficiency numbers, is awful. Typical efficiency for this is not far off from a Rivian, and that's a 7,000 pound truck. Shut up, bird. Thankfully, the 2024 refresh of the Polestar 2 addresses both of these issues. They gave it all new motors, which are something like 20% more efficient. They also changed the power distribution from symmetrical to rear biased. They gave it an all new battery pack with increased capacity from 78 kilowatt hours gross to 82 kilowatt hours gross, and it charges faster. Peak speed is now 205 kilowatts, and the 10 to 80% time has dropped to just under 30 minutes. And they gave it an uglier nose. 
While those upgrades might not sound like much, they're a big deal. To illustrate that point, I route planned a trip from St. Louis to Phoenix using a better route planner. In my car, ABRP estimates I'll need 11 charging stops and spend 5 hours charging. If I route plan the same trip but select a 24 model year Polestar 2 instead, the number of charging stops drops by 2 and the time spent charging drops by over an hour. I mean, just look at the difference in estimation between these two cars. It estimates my car will average 2.8 miles per kilowatt hour of the trip, while the new one will average 3.3 miles per kilowatt hour. Again, these are both dual motor cars I've selected. What's even crazier is that's just the difference in efficiency. ABRP, looking at the numbers, doesn't seem to be accounting for the newer car's faster charging speeds, so it might actually be even faster. So am I gonna go out and buy a 24 model year Polestar 2? Well, no. First of all, there's the whole depreciation thing. The only reason I'd recommend you go out and buy a new Polestar is if you're a fiscal arsonist. But also, I casually left out some rather important information. In the US, only the single motor rear wheel drive cars get the new battery. The dual motor cars get the same battery my car has with its 150 kilowatt charging and 78 kilowatt hour gross capacity. The motors are more efficient, but the battery is no upgrade. And there's more to the new battery than just the numbers. One thing I do not like about the battery in my Polestar is how useless the bottom end of the pack is. It starts reducing power at about 13% state of charge, and it'll go into turtle mode at as high as 8% state of charge. Below about 6% state of charge, it's reduced power by so much, you cannot safely use the car on the highway anymore. Because of this, I consider 10% to be zero. The new battery doesn't do this. I was watching a Pierre Newland video where he was testing a new Polestar with the new battery pack, and he still had full power at 4%, and probably lower than that. So while on paper the new battery is only 4 kilowatt hours more capacity, it's effectively more like 10 kilowatt hours more capacity because you can actually use the bottom 10% of the pack. But again, US dual motor cars don't get the new battery. You may have noticed I've been talking about efficiency, not range. Well, there's a reason for that. Why am I doing this? Pick a location and stay there. Here? Okay, given my slight battery degradation and the typical efficiency numbers I see, my real world range is maybe 200 miles, but realistically a bit less than that. And remember, I don't consider the bottom 10% of my battery to exist, nor do I consider the top 10% of my battery to exist on trips because charging from 90 to 100% on any charger takes nearly an hour. And since I'm at most using 80% of my battery's usable capacity on trips, my real world range on trips is more like 150 miles, although I'm typically not comfortable pushing it past 140 miles between chargers unless there's a headwind. In that case, I'm finding a closer charger. Again, this is all dramatically improved with the new Polestar's motors and batteries, but that's not what I have. Polestar's option packages are simple. You have the Pilots Plus and Performance package, and on top of the Plus package, you can get the Napa Leather Seating package, which, by the way, is the only way to get ventilated seats in a Polestar 2. When I ordered my car, the market was very different. Used prices were high, and inventory was a theoretical construct. So when I ordered my car, I could either have exactly the car I wanted and wait six months for it, or I could pick a suboptimally optioned car from the small, available, pre-configured inventory and have it almost immediately. So which one do you think I picked? None of the cars in their inventory at the time had all three packages, so I had to pick one package to do without. And the package I chose to omit was the Pilot Pack. The Pilot Pack includes all of these features, but obviously the headlining feature is Pilot Assist, which is Polestar's name for adaptive cruise and auto steer. So that's why my car doesn't have the Pilot Pack, essentially because I'm impatient. But here's the thing about cars like mine without the Pilot Package. They still have all of the hardware for Pilot Assist, including the buttons on the steering wheel. It's just turned off and all you get is basic cruise control. And I guess four fidgety buttons to play with on the steering wheel. Remember that third-party diagnostic software I mentioned earlier? Well, it can do more than just read stats from the car. It can also change car configurations. So I used it to turn on Pilot Assist. I now have Pilot Assist. So how is Pilot Assist? Well, I lived with this car for about 70,000 miles with just basic cruise control. Finally, having adaptive cruise control is so nice. Previously, if I got stuck behind a car that was doing a little bit slower than me or varying their speed a little bit, I would get so annoyed. But now, I don't care. I can just sit behind them and let the car vary the speed for me. It's just the best thing ever. Like right now, I'm half distracted delivering lines to camera, and I'm stuck behind this Borrego. I don't care. It's so relaxing. 10 out of 10 would unlock again. The auto steer part, however, is less good. 
In fact, it's kind of bad. It's the kind of auto steer that tries to suck you down every off-ramp, and it requires so much input torque on the wheel to know that you're there that you almost have to hang your hand on the side of the wheel. Otherwise, it'll yell at you and say, keep your hands on the wheel, even if your hands are on the wheel. It's not, not great. And it does some really goofy things sometimes. For instance, the two systems for lane departure warning and the auto steer must be separate because multiple times the auto steer portion has made me ride the yellow line on the side of the highway while the steering wheel is vibrating telling me that I'm riding the yellow line on the side of the highway even though it's doing that itself. It's, it's kind of comical but I would rather have it than not have it so also 10 out of 10 would unlock again. I also unlocked the matrix LED headlights which are disabled on all cars in the US so I have those now too. Honestly, it's much more fun to watch them work than they are actually useful, but it was still worth unlocking them for. Quick word about Orbit. I'm not recommending it. I'm just telling you that's what I used. There's every chance using third-party diagnostic software to change configurations and generally fiddle about with the car could void your warranty or even break stuff. I'm using it at my own risk, and again, I'm not recommending it. Again, jumping to a completely different topic, range estimates. I've told you before that this car provides four different range estimates. That's still true, but now the situation is even sillier. Polestar sent out a software update at some point last year that now allows you to choose which range estimate you want shown in the driver's display. On by default, and previously the only number you could see here, is the rated range, which is just the EPA rated range number multiplied by the battery state of charge percentage, which is totally meaningless. It's even more useless in the European market because they use the WLTP cycle, which is overly optimistic and garbage. Side note, WLTP numbers are meaningless. The WLTP cycle tests cars at room temperature with an average speed of 29 miles per hour. Super realistic. But now you can have the estimated range, which takes into account conditions and previous driving efficiency shown in the driver's display by going to range assistant, hitting the settings, and then selecting dynamic range. And now the range number drops by 50 miles, which just shows you how useless the rated range number is. It might make you feel good, but don't rely on it because it's meaningless. Side note, I have a theory that the F-150 Lightning gets thrown under the bus for range far more often than a Rivian R1T does, despite having similar real world ranges, because the Lightning shows a real world estimated projected range, while the Rivian shows rated range, which doesn't change at all based on conditions. Of course, the reason Polestar, Rivian, Tesla, and so many others show you rated range is because it makes for good publicity. I've seen so many automotive journalists sit behind the wheel and just take the range number it presents to you at face value and will confidently say to camera, on a full charge, it'll go 240 miles. Well, no, it won't, but it'll say it does. In last year's update, I told you that although I love my Polestar 2 and I have no intention of getting rid of it anytime soon, the Model 3 is probably the logical choice to go with. Well, now I'm not so sure about that anymore. For sure, if you're going to buy a new car, then yeah, the Model 3 is still the logical choice. A Model 3 is $5,000 cheaper than an equivalently spec Polestar as of this recording. And if you add on the performance pack to the Polestar, it becomes infinitely more expensive because the Model 3 performance currently doesn't exist. But in the used market, get whatever you want. Polestars get access to not all, but most Tesla superchargers, I think at the end of June. So that playing field is leveled and I've already got the adapter, I'm ready. Teslas have better software, faster charging, much higher efficiency, but the Polestar is a much nicer place to be. It drives better, it handles better, obviously subjective opinions. And because this was built in China while the Model 3 was built in the US, naturally, this has much higher build quality. That one's for you, easily triggered Americans. But anyway, just get the car you want. The used market for both Teslas and Polestars has absolutely crashed, which is great if you're looking for a used car. Terrible for people like me that bought it new, but great if you're looking for a used car. Did, did I do a car buying advice? Did you get any value out of this video? Yeah, no, this video was all over the place. Anyway, I love my Polestar and I have no plans of getting rid of it anytime soon. And I'm not just saying that because I owe twice what it's worth. I'm never buying a new car again. This has been an awful experience. Buying weird crap that no one wants has been a great investment so far. Much more solid than buying a new car. Thanks for watching.